Well, good afternoon. Um, it's uh, fantastic uh, to be here. Um, we've had enough jokes about weather in Sydney, so don't go down that road. Um, I'm uh, actually I'm not really quite sure why I am here, actually, because I'm sort of I've always been suspicious of marketing. Uh, 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 you know, and I've sat in those meetings where all kinds of terminology is used, and I'm sitting there thinking, am I the only one in the room who has no idea what they're talking about? And uh, I probably was. Um, it was my background where well, I went to uh, art school, I wanted to be a painter. From that, I went to design school where I thought I was going to be a great graphic designer. And I was very fortunate in meeting a wonderful, wonderful man who introduced me to the work of uh, William Birnbach, uh, and I had a light switched on in my brain because I always loved ideas and I saw ideas that were smart, sharp, brilliant and inclusive and that got me into this industry and I've loved it ever since. Um, as you've probably seen by now, I, my title of my talk is, is this the most exciting time to be in marketing? And there's something else, I, a couple of other things I'm going to say too. First of all, I don't give a shit. All right? I really don't. I really, really don't. You know, I'm, uh, you know, I've done well in life. You know, it's wonderful to be here. I actually really, really don't give a shit, you know. And so I'm going to say things that actually a lot of you are going to disagree with. And I really love that. Because I've spent my life arguing with clients. Um, and I'm going to sort of try and explode a few myths because I think one of the great skills creative people have when they're really, really good is that they're perpetual children. And they, they, you know, I mean, they don't understand why you don't want to make something better. And the number of times I've been in meetings when, you know, the client has said to me, yes, it's, it's good, and then proceeds to make it worse. Um, <laughs> And I used to come out of the meeting scratching my head. You know, I said, well, why do they want to make it worse? You know, it's like walking into a supermarket and sort of seeing a bunch of bananas that are beautiful, you know, and a bunch that are kind of like getting slightly rotten. And you go, well, I think I'll have the rotten ones, actually. I looked at the bananas, and I think I'll have the rotten ones. Uh, and that seems to me often what I'm dealing with. But anyway, <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of here to talk about is this the most uh, exciting time to be in uh, the marketing business. One other thing I have to say about myself is that I'm cursed as an optimist. So you've also got to understand I'll probably you know, be over-enthusiastic about things. Um, but uh, some home truths. I'm, we're living in an incredible period of time. Uh, technology is coming at us, we've heard about it today, we've looked at it in ways which are unimaginable, unimaginable. Um, and that's just incredible. But alongside that, and I'm going to take a very sort of European, Western kind of view of this, because I'm not, you know, I heard, we just heard about, by the way, we're all moving to fucking China, aren't we? I mean, Jesus, you know. <laughs> I don't think you have to do anything. Just open a store. Boom, they come roaring in. <laughs> Fuck me. <laughs> God, blimey. How many cities? Jesus. Um, <laughs> I've forgotten where I was now. <laughs> but um, I just get carried away with those things. I just think it's absolutely amazing. But, I mean, it's... Um, I think, you know, and I'm having this point of view, I think marketing is letting us down. And I think marketing has been letting us down for a very, very long time. Um, and there is empirical evidence in the UK. It's a piece of research that's done in the UK. And it says to our audience, and I will use the word audience, not consumers. I loathe the word consumers. I think it's insulting. Uh, and I don't use it. Um, they talk to the audience we talk to and they say, what do you think? This piece, of ever, this piece of research has been done for the last 25 years, 20 odd years. What do you think of the advertising? And each year, our, our audience, the people we're talking to, think what we are doing is getting worse. 
Now, it's not my opinion. I'm not some aging old art director who thinks it was brilliant in the early 80s, um, because I don't genuinely don't believe that. But our audience think what we are doing is getting worse. Now, I don't know what business books you lot have been reading, but I have not read one business book that says the way to solve your problems is to make the product worse. Now, maybe you have. I don't know. I've, I'm, just, I'm still confused. Um, and that's where we are. Despite all this incredible technology that is out at our disposal. And, um, you know, the great thing about, I mean, I, because I'm, I love this industry, I love what I've done, I, I'm very proud of it, I always used to have to kind of defend people saying, all oh, advertising, you know, why are you in advertising? And I say, well, it's, you know, it's brilliant business and it's wonderful and you can do great work and stuff like that. And they say, yes, but, you know, it's, uh, it, it's just selling stuff to people they don't want, which I fundamentally disagree with. And I say, you know, you've got to understand it's a basic democratic right. It's a democratic right for you to have an idea and to take that idea to the market. And not many marketing people in North Korea. If you want to move to North Korea, you can, but there aren't many marketing people there. So, but the answer back from that was always, you're right, John. That's absolutely right. It is a, is a democratic right, but it's a rich man's right. It takes a lot of money. TV ads, very expensive. Posters, very expensive. Advertising, expensive business. So it suits the corporation rather than the individual. Well, over the last 15 years, that's changed. Now, with technology, you can genuinely, genuinely, as a very, very small producer, manufacturer, ideas person, whatever, go to market. And that has been transformative. But in everything that we're looking at, our, our audience believe what we're producing is getting worse. So essentially, I'm going to be talking round about that. Now, there is one other thing that I wanted to uh, uh, expose to you. And it's a very, very, one of the things I do, by the way, and I think we should all do, I kind of read stuff that I'm not supposed to read. Uh, and I don't mean pornography or things like that, you know. <laughs> um, but one of the things I do is I read the Financial Times every day. And I know we're partly sponsored by Financial Review, I think it is. Apologies, sorry about that. I don't get it in the UK. Um, which I understand about 4.5% on a good day. And the point, though, of me reading stuff like that, and I try and get all my creative people to just read stuff that you wouldn't normally read. You know, it's going to be interesting. You know, you'll just be that you pick up amazing articles. You pick up just ever so often something you go, that is absolutely fantastic. And the article that I'm about to show you was sort of um, uh, two and a half, uh, year and a, just a year and a bit ago. And it's this one. Is the age of unlimited growth over? Obviously not if you're in China, but anyway, you know. Um, we're going to keep that joke going, actually, the Chinese joke. Well, enough of them. I mean, we can have a joke about it, can't we? Um, but it's a really, really interesting article. And it, what it says is that certain technologies, and I could read it. I, I suggest you get it and read it. It's, it's um, Martin Wolf, who's a fantastic journalist for the FT, um, just says that the, the technologies of the 20th century, the internal combustion engine, telecommunications, clean water, population growth, um, all of those things that have gone through our economy had a fantastic impact on growth. Fantastic. And, and he goes on and talks about uh, uh, the internet and computers and modern technology. It's had a very limited impact on growth, actually, surprisingly. Um, and you're reading this, and there's a debate, actually. Some economists disagree with this, and he actually is, is sort of slightly skeptical. But it's a very, very interesting article. And it's written by, uh, it's from a, an American economist uh, saying, so get used to uh, lower growth. And that's a bit of a problem if you're in the marketing industry, isn't it? Because part of what you do is, you know, I'm trying to increase market share, or I'm trying to get more sales. 
you know, the fact that growth is constantly going up is like a sort of, you know, uh, a, a wind blowing you along. Well, what happens if that wind isn't there? So I'm reading it, and of course, you know, I'm thinking this is, I, I'm just fascinated by those kinds of things. And so, it's a very obvious one, is I say to myself, and yet they don't talk about this because it's the Financial Times, that actually um, you have to create a competitive uh, uh, edge with creativity. Now, you might say, well, that's bloody obvious, John, isn't it? But if it's obvious, why is it I spend all my time trying to get marketing people to be more creative? Uh, instead of that brilliant thing that happens, if you're a creative person in this room, you'll laugh at this one, that brilliant thing you get when you know, you've had the client meeting, you've gone there and you've come out and everybody's gone, that was great, we're going to research. <laughs> and I always say, well, well, why did we go to the meeting? Why don't we just cut the meeting out and just go straight to research and save time? And, you know, the client's in a really great mood. I love this. We're going to research. And, and as we heard today from John, uh, we research stuff and it all collapses and fails. Um, and that's because, and I'm convinced of this, I'm convinced all you marketing people want it to be a science. You do, don't you? Don't you all? It's not that bad, you know. It's not, you know. Uh, you want it to be a science. I, you know, if you could just make it a science, it would make life so much easier. I could all, uh, add it all up, do that, get the equation right, go home and play golf. And, well, it's not. You know, selling stuff has never been a science. It's about persuasion. And persuasion is an art. And it will never, ever be that, despite big data, you know. Big, don't get me going on big data anyway. I've already, have, I've already been blogged on my view. It's great, isn't it? It's been, been, it was data, it's now big data. We're branding people, we know this bollocks. You know, we've called it big data. Oh, what, well, I'm going to send a Christmas card next Christmas. That's what it's telling me. Yeah, I could have told you that without big data. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, you look at it, it's just, who's believing this stuff? One of the problems, one of the problems of being around for as long as I have is you heard it. So many times, you know. Oh, eyeball recognition. Oh, yeah, remember that one? No, oh, I do. I, uh, uh, <laughs> there was another one which was uh, commercial compression. And that somebody had a bit of technology in the early 70s where they could compress a 30 second commercial down to sort of 26 seconds. And so clients were making you believing that what you should do is write a 34 second commercial, we compress it down to 30 seconds and people would watch it more. I mean, and they believed it, you know. And these were in, they seriously, I promise you, it was called commercial compression. Anyway, I digress. I probably will quite a lot. But this may not be a talk, it may be a rant. <clears throat> so, I think that's really interesting. And the reason it's interesting, creativity is, it, it's a fascinating, most people don't understand creativity. If you're working in it, you kind of get to understand it. Most people don't really understand how it works. Um, and I say, you know, I, one of the questions that always gets thrown back to me is, I'm in a meeting, we're deciding something, and they, the, the, the people in that room say to me, oh, well, John, you're creative, so you must make the decision. I say, no, 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 we're all creative. You know, it's just I earn my living by it. We are all creative. It's so important that we remember that. You know, somebody once said music is the greatest of all art forms. And it's not. It's the second greatest of all art, for art forms. Life is the greatest of all art forms. Therefore, expression of self is a way of defining creativity. Creativity is an expression of self. And that's very, very important. And within that are carried lots of lots of thoughts. Um, so, well, I'm falling behind here. I'm looking at this clock. So. In other words, another expression of creativity is, could be this. The essence of creativity is to take a number of known assets and reassemble them in a way that stimulates our imagination. So I'm reading this article in the Financial Times, and I'm going, they're saying it's all over, or this economist is saying it, and I'm going, but it's not if you employ creativity. If you employ creativity, I can take all those known assets, I can reassemble them and represent them, in a way you hadn't thought about before. And that's so important to remember. 
And, you know, so what's an example of that? Well, that is a perfect example of that thought. All of that technology was out there. It was all there for everybody. It was there for Nokia, except Nokia was kind of focused on making it smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And they hadn't realized there was a bigger opportunity. Somebody else did, and they realized it was a much bigger opportunity, and they did that. You know, somebody said to me recently, um, you know, you've worked for a long time in, in an industry, in the industry, and you've come across lots and lots of brands. Is there a kind of way you can observe when a, when a, when a corporation is in decline? When is it about to go? Or going down? And I, my theory is when process overtakes innovation. And that's when a company is on the downward path. Now, the downward path might glide for quite a long way. It might nosedive like poor old Nokia. But basically, they're in decline when process overtakes innovation. And what we have in our industry now is procurement. Now, that wonderful word. Somebody convinced me here today that they're a creative procurement person. Well, I'll, you know, I'll believe it if I see it. <laughs> Maybe they are. I don't know. But how I take the value out of everything uh, is the danger in that. So, you know, you look at a company. There was, there was you know, January 2012, Kodak file for bankruptcy. June 2012, Instagram is sold for a billion dollars to Facebook. What happened? Kodak had become obsessed with process. They hadn't realized they were in the imaging business. Had they, they might have changed who they are and what they were doing, but they didn't. So, constantly examining what you are, who you are, how do I employ creativity, what is it there for, to, to do for me, is fundamental to your success. Because you are all creative people. We're all creative. You're in marketing, you're a creative person. That is the most important thing to remember. Um, so, I know, I, this was brought home to me, too, this whole point. When I was, we were, uh, I was working on the launch of the Audi TT, and we had done rather a famous campaign in the UK, and we'd introduced this line called Vorsprung der Technik, which means, you know, winning through technology, being, staying ahead. Vorsprung, we don't quite have a translation of the word. So every time I was sort of, you know, they said to me, John, you know, we're launching a new car, I was always, well, what's the Vorsprung? And when I went to the engineers at Audi, and I said, so what's the Vorsprung in this? And they said, they looked at me and said, there isn't one. And I thought, that's bloody good, isn't it? Whose idea was this? Um, <laughs> And uh, they said, no, 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 John, you're missing the point. The Vorsprung is the way we've packaged it. And the way we've packaged it will reawaken people's view of driving a car. And that was it, and we all know it was the one product, more than anything, that has repositioned uh, Audi. And it was a brilliant piece of thinking. I thought it was so fantastic that it was just repositioning that car, uh, uh, repositioning Audi, with everything in that car, was they could have got it anywhere. They had it in all their cars. There was no Vorsprung in it whatsoever, except the way they did it. They reassembled it in a way that re reawakened your imagination. Fundamentally, fundamentally important. So um, I thought what I would show is uh, how we've done that in our own work. And i just show you a, a piece of advertising, and I'll show you how it's uh, uh, su been successful for Lynx Axe. It works in with different names in different parts of the world. Um, but basically, we won this business in about 95, and it was a product that was sold. It, you know, it's made you smell better, and uh, girls would like you, and that would be wonderful. Um, but what we said is, no, 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 it's, it's more than that. Actually, we converted it to being about seduction. We moved the brand from that to seduction. And with changing nothing, doing absolutely nothing, with just purely an idea to reposition it, we've created advertising for, for Lynx that has transformed that marketplace. And one of the things that we always did in this advertising is that we always said, the audience we're talking to knows this is a joke. They know it's not absolutely true. They know that, you know, oh, I spray this on and girls will throw themselves at me. It, no, 
<laughs> and so we always recognized in the advertising that it was a joke. And we showed geeks, not handsome guys. We showed the geek rather than that and said, you know, you will get from this what we're talking about. So this is one of the latest campaigns we've done. And I think the other thing to say about it is how, you know, again, one of the exciting things about the business is how you can link everything together. And I'll very quickly tell you, you know, I always say to people, I, you know, because it was, I came into this business so long ago, it's just unbearable to even think about it. But it was, it really is, I promise you. I kind of sometimes think, I can't be still doing this. I am. Um, but it was 1965. I was working at an, a, a, an American agency called Benson and Bowles. Even they don't exist, like the dinosaurs, you know. And I was taken to see a presentation for a big petrol uh, retailer in the UK. They don't exist either. Um, I think I'm the only one who does, actually. Um, <laughs> and, but what was brilliant in this, I was allowed to go and see the rehearsal for it. In, one, in the first conference room, they had the idea all on boards. In the second conference room, they had the, how they're taking it down into the, uh, into the petrol stations. And in the third room, they were showing how they were taking it to, as they called them, the consumer. 1965. So when people say to me, it's all about integration, my head shakes and I go, oh, God. Um, and the reason, actually, most integration isn't done is because you lot won't do it. You won't. You won't do it. You know, the moment of times I've been in meetings and said, so we'll integrate this like that. No, 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 don't do that. I'll get X and blogs to do that and they'll do that and they'll fuck it up and, that'll it, and it won't integrate, you know. <laughs> so now we actually do, and this is an example of, of, of what we're doing. I'm not saying that lots of great examples. So let me show you. This is for, for Lynx Axe uh, and it shows you one of the latest campaigns and I'll show you how this campaign, this thinking has transformed uh, this brand. Space Academy. Join now at linksapollo.com for your chance to go to space. Space Academy. Join now at linksapollo.com for your chance to go to space. All communications across the Apollo campaign point people to axapollo.com, the global hub site live in 70 countries, available in 60 languages. On the homepage of axapollo.com, you'll find an intro video. Legitimacy is an issue when you claim to be sending 22 young men into space, so we got a real astronaut to help add credibility. Buzz Aldrin. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Buzz Aldrin. 44 years ago, I made a brave decision to journey into space, and it changed my life forever. And now you too can become a member of this privileged group and experience everything that I have.
The Lynx Space Academy is looking for regular people like you to go into space. If selected, you'll be sent to our space camp in Florida for rigorous astronaut training. The top recruits will then be rocketed into suborbit in an SXC spacecraft. Are you ready to make history? Then join the Lynx Space Academy and leave a man come back a hero. Good luck, everyone. Now, um, what's, I mean, apart from obviously the integration, what we do now with, with this is that Unilever used to always come up with a fragrance. They'd give us the fragrance or whatever it was called, and we'd create the, the, the advertising around it. We now start with the idea, and then they make the fragrance, and then they take that to market. So it's a kind of, they've realized and recognized that this is actually about marketing. You know, market a great idea. The fragrance, we can do every like with it. And uh, it's making, it's having a transformative effect on their business. And that's uh, what's happened to that business since we started in it in 95 with this whole uh, issue around um, seduction, not smell nice. Uh, and... Uh, as you can see, it's creating real value. And what have we changed? We've just changed the thinking. It's all we've changed. Obviously, the executions, but the thinking. And uh, that is fundamentally important. And we call it turning intelligence into magic. And I think that's the great thing. I mean, certainly a number of agencies uh, uh, do this, but I think that's the big thing that made uh, a difference at BBH. We kind of went... You know, we've got to have that strategic thinking that is actually at the foundation, and then the creativity leaps from that. It isn't tied down by that. It's not a, it's not a box, the intelligence. It's a platform that we can leap from. Uh, and I think because of that, we've created work that's more powerful uh, and uh, more persuasive in the marketplace. So, you know, I look at that, and uh, I, I kind of... You know, one of the things that really pisses me off today you know, is, you know, we talk about, you know, we've gone from the age of interruption to the age of entertainment. And I'm spending most of my time now answering questions about, about how brands are tripping the, uh, the audience up into seeing their messages. You know, I'll, impl I'll embed something on a piece of, you know, a twat or a twit or whatever it is, or, you know. <laughs> and, you know, no, I mean, I, you know, it's wonderful. I love it. Um, and, you know, it's about deception. You know, and I say to people, I did not come into this business to be deceptive. I really didn't. I came into this business because I thought I could create work that was inspiring. And I think great brands are inspiring. They inspire people to come to them. And the ones that last the longest are the ones that are doing that. And even though people say we've moved from the age of interruption to entertainment, then, you know, uh, they're not really believing it as they're constantly trying to find a way of tripping people up. Before you know where it was, you've been conned into looking at this ad. Why? Why not do something that people want to look at? I know it's difficult. I know it means that you may not, you know, be able to leave for the golf course at five o'clock. You know, you might stay a bit later. But that's what we've got to do. Otherwise, there will be a terrible backlash to our marketing industry and the advertising industry. So it's about, it is about entertainment, but it's about inspiration, inspiring people to come to you. And I think, you know, a lot of people say, you know, what's happened over the last 15 years with technology is, is it's revolutionized the communication industry. I, do, I don't, I really genuinely don't think it has. I think what it has done is liberated uh, the communications industry. And the way you can now do things, the way you can talk to people is, in a, is so fantastic. I mean, we've done things, I mean, for instance, we did a, a, a small little uh, project for, for Johnny Walker on our Keep Walking campaign. They just came to us and they said, you know, um, look, we've got this uh, need to make a, a, a PR video for when people come to this distillery, we can show them the history of uh, uh, Johnny Walker. And uh, the creative team thought, oh, that's interesting. They had th about £40,000 to do it, so it was scrap art. So the creative team came back and said, wow, no, we can, you know, we can do something much better than just that. And they came up with this idea of getting Robert Carlyle to do this walk 
And in doing this walk, he explained Johnny Walker, the history of Johnny Walker. And it was so fantastic as a performance. It got onto YouTube. We were able to then go to Robert Carlyle, the actor, and say, look, it's leaked onto YouTube. Do you mind if we run it, ran it in cinemas? He loved it so much. He said, please do run it in cinemas. And that was £40,000. It then went on to get a gold award at Cannes, and it almost won the Grand Prix three years ago. Now, that's what you can do, £40,000. So don't let anybody in this room say to me, yeah, it's all right for you, John. You've got big budgets, and you can do that. And we can't. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. It can be done. So this is why I think fantastic time to be around and be in this business. And this is the thing that always gets me. I, you know, a bad idea costs the same as a great idea. Now I go back to my bananas. You know, oh, they look really rotten. I'll have those. Yeah. Um, why? You know, why? Why do you buy ordinary ideas when you can have a great idea? It's just at that moment in time. It's just a bit of paper. You know, it's a bit of it's a thought. It's a something we're talking about it. Why not have a great idea? You know, when you've got a, when I've presented a great idea and then you say, wow, this is a really good idea, why don't you turn around to me and say, John, that is a really good idea. How can we make it better? Instead of, John, that's a really good idea. But what it doesn't do is this. Of course it fucking doesn't. It was never designed to, you know? You know? Like a Porsche was never designed to tow a caravan. You know, there's something wrong with everything. You know, <laughs> spend your time looking at what is good and making it great. But that's what happens. The no I, could, I could, honest to God, I could tell you, uh, probably on both hands, a number of times a client has said to me, John, that's really, really good. Now let's make it, how can we make it better? Now, how many of you, when you buy ideas, do that? I don't know. Whitbread, when we worked with Whitbread, when they were a brewing company, they trained their marketing people that when they saw an idea, they were to talk about what was good about it before they talked about what was bad about it. Now, I spend most of my time when I'm presenting ideas, and then it opens up to the floor, you know, that wonderful moment, when, and it goes around the room, and all the people, nobody wants to say it's great, because it's really smart to find something that's wrong with it. Oh, you're quite right, yeah, no, it probably doesn't do that, but it never was designed to do it, you know. So, you know, my advice to you is kind of, you know, it's, it's a, we, you're in the ideas business. It's just an idea. Lynx is just an idea. Anybody could have it. It's just smelly stuff in a can. You know, it costs about, you know, 10 cents to make. What's brilliant about it is the marketing and the advertising. We're in that world. And if we don't accept that, then go and become dentists or something like that, you know. <laughs> Now, the other thing is that, you know, you all know the Marshall McLuhan uh, uh, quote, the medium is the message. Well, I, th I, you know, it's quite often hard to define what, he, what did he really mean by that, if you think about it. I mean, I don't know. But I think I understood what he meant about it. But, you know, it was that if you were using television, just by using it, you were making a huge statement. Well, I think that's wrong now, actually. I don't think the medium is the message. I think uh, the message is the medium. Because if you put something great out there, if you actually communicate something that is absolutely fantastic, it, today's world, it carries on, it goes on, and it has a fantastic life. One of the things that we're doing at BBH, um, certainly in, in the UK, we have, a, we have a great belief in the power of television. I, you know, I'll be honest, and I think in life, be prejudiced. You know, I'm prejudiced. I love television. I love storytelling. That's what I'm... I love doing. But what we now try and do is, and I don't, you know, when things, you know, if I got up on a platform, I was here, you know, five years ago and said the future is television, I'd have been laughed off the stage. Get out, John. You know, you really have, for, you know, you've lost it. Lo and behold, television, golden age, you know. What are people watching? Game of Thrones, House of Cards, you know, great series. You know, that's what people, people are loving it. Television is hugely powerful. So, you know, using a medium, but using it in a different way is fundamentally important. What we do now, uh, quite a bit, uh, at the agency, is instead of spending uh, money on sort of, you know, 10 or 15, 30 second, 40 second minute spots, whatever it might be, we now take the money and we write, hopefully, hopefully, a brilliant idea and we make a three second, 
a, 30, um, a three minute film and run that as the ad. Then what happens is it goes into social media, we start a debate, people start to talk about it, those that haven't seen it go back and see it on YouTube, so suddenly your media budget is ten times the amount you spent. That's using it inventively. But the idea has got to be truly great because you're starting a debate. And I think that's a fantastic thing to start doing. A great way of using the media today and how, as an example, I talk about how uh, we've been liberated. Marketing and advertising have been liberated with technology. Technology fundamentally important to both creativity uh, and obviously marketing. So, you know, um, I think this is, uh, believe it or not, a fantastic time to be in this industry. I really, really genuinely do. And it's just not my mad optimism that's making that point. I think it's uh, only a great time if it's actually grasped, if we actually say what we've got to do is genuinely use uh, creativity. And, I, and I, I'm just going to say something about, and I'll just give you a... There is, you know, people talk about the creative process and, you know, we talk today a lot about collaboration and collaboration is fundamentally important. And obviously collaboration is fundamentally important, but at what point do you collaborate? And... Um, and I'll just tell you this, because I'm so bored with having, hearing people tell me about creativity when they actually don't do it. You know, they sort of, you know, they write books on it and they've never had an idea in their life. There are two types of creativity. There's pure creativity and there's applied creativity. Now, pure creativity is painting the Mona Lisa or it's thinking up the Simpsons, right? Or it's designing the Sydney Opera House. Pure bit of creativity came out of this man's head. Applied creativity is writing the 30-second episode of The Simpsons or working out how the staircases operate within the Sydney Opera House and maintaining the structure. You understand the problem that you've got to solve. It's contained. Pure creative people do not want to be in brainstorming sessions. Their brains seize up, all right? Applied creativity, yes, you can. You know, we're going to sit around and talk about new materials and we could do this. Oh, that's very interesting. And a lot of creative so-called companies think they understand how to use creativity but don't understand those two vital differences. And I'll give you one other piece of advice. Sitting on a beanbag does not make you creative, all right? <laughs> Especially with a laptop and wearing a beanie, all right? It probably makes you very uncreative, but hey, if you're sort of doing something on a media advertising creative company, let's show people sitting on a beanbag. Oh, Jesus Christ, you know. <sighs> Where do they come from? So, pure creativity is coming up with that idea. That idea that's gonna come out of somebody's head that's a piece of madness that you harness and you go, this could be fantastic, this could actually transform the market. Because that's what you can do. You can inspire people and transform a market. So, what I'd like to do now is I'm gonna leave you with kind of, um, I kind of have these things that I kind of talk about. Uh, and I'm going to leave you with five things that I think are important. And I've talk, touched a, a little bit on them. Because hopefully I, I'm imparting what I have discovered. You don't have to agree with it, as I said. You know, you can disagree with a whole lot of it if you want. I don't mind. I'll be on a plane on Friday going back to London. Um, it's up to you. Uh, first of all, broadcast. Broadcast is fundamentally important. Fundamentally important. The great definition uh, of a brand, and I think it's so, it, you should have it, every marketing person should have it above their walls, is a brand is made not just by the people who buy it, but by the peop also by the people who know about it. And that requires broadcast. <coughs> Whatever you define as broadcast, you can define it any way you like, but basically you have to broadcast in some shape or form. You know, I always think, um, <clears throat> I sometimes use religious metaphors because it upsets some people and uh, it makes a good point. But I always think, you know, Christ, 
He didn't stand on the rock and preach to the masses. Did, you know, he preached to the masses, didn't he? He got up on the rock and he preached to the masses. He didn't get up on the rock and say, now look, I'd just like to talk to 18 to 24 year olds with a disposable income of 24 shekels a week. No, he spoke to the masses. Because ultimately he was trying to convert. He was trying to get people to join him. And a brand ultimately doesn't know where all its people are. You've got to broadcast. You know that? Whoever said, you know, 50% of my advertising uh, is wasted, nobody can tell me which 50%. Obviously a complete idiot and didn't know, and didn't know anything about advertising. Um, but yet it's always used, isn't it? Oh, that's a very clever thing to say. No, it's not. It fails to understand that a part of what you're doing is conversion. Because if you're not converting, you're dying. And if your job is to help the brand die, then fine. That's, you know, it's a different <laughs> definition from the one I thought. Um, now, the other great one I love is, you know, if you read lots of business books today, they all kind of talk about risk, don't they? You know, risk, adopt risk, be risky, take a risk strategy. And, you know, you see them all, and I, <laughs> I look at them and I go, bugger that, risk. I don't like risk at all. What? Hey, I don't go home to my good lady and say, hey, you know, darling, I think we should go on a risky holiday. <laughs> I really would love to have a risky holiday. Really be fantastic. And actually, there's this new car out. It's very risky. I think we should buy it. <laughs> or what about that restaurant? It's really risky. You know, you never know. You might get some terrible illness, but let's go there. No, no. I mean, it's completely stupid. So, you know, I'm going into you and I'm showing you an idea and I'm saying, yes, you've got to buy it because it's risky. And you're going, and everything, everything in your body is going, no, no, I don't know. I don't want risk. We don't. I don't either. So, you know, I try and say to clients, don't, let's not talk about risk. Let's talk about excitement. Isn't this exciting? This could be an exciting idea. This could be an exciting development. It really could change things. Do I want to go on an exciting holiday? Yeah. Do I want to buy an exciting car? Yes. Do I want to go to an exciting restaurant? Yes. You know, do I want to go to a risky one? No. So take all those books that you've been reading about risk, put them in the bin and recycle them. Um, the other I'm going to think, uh, my third point is be consistent. Uh, we. Uh, we live in a world today where everything moves so fast, we've got to change, we've got to do that, we've got to do this. The consumer the, is changing all the time, you should be changing. No. Consistency wins every time. Now, what you do with consistency is you refresh, you keep it fresh. And I always say that the, the, um, there are the, I, I sort of say the two most important charts in advertising, actually it's slightly more than two, but anyway, I'll get them down to two, is and I've got them, sadly I haven't got them here, but it's, I, I dug them out and got this little bit of research on it. 1987, Nike launch, just do it. Um, market share, this is US figures, market share about 21%. Reebok, uh, that year, 1987, launch uh, UBU. Market share about 19, 20%, about the same. 15 years on from that, Nike, just do it, 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 just do it. Reebok, different line every, literally different line every year. End of that 15 years, Nike market share, 51%. Reebok market share, 18% sold to Adidas. Consistency. What they did was they were consistent in their, in, their, uh, in their beliefs and they just kept refreshing it. Be consistent. Resist that thing of, oh, it's all changed and everything's moving so fast, we've got to... No. No. Um, my fourth point is uh, tell the truth. And, you know, I mean, I'm not trying to be smart and clever here, but... If you go back and look at the history of marketing, the greatest campaigns, the ones that had longevity behind them, the ones that genuinely moved the market, they told the truth. And it's, we have a weird kind of relationship with the truth. Don't we? we like it, but we find it difficult to tell it on all sorts of fronts. You know, how many cigarettes do you smoke? Ooh, I better not tell you that. I'll, I'll lie. You know, how much do you drink? Oh, I'm going to lie about that. We have a real problem with the truth, but yet 
great marketing, great advertising has a fundamental truth to it. Trick is to make it interesting, turn it into something interesting. And I've always said, you know, in, in all the work I've done, and I, I, you know, from Levi's to Audi, to all the great brands I've worked on, tell the truth. Uh, and it's fantastic. And I'm somebody who can kind of, it makes it easier for me because I'm not so intelligent that I can keep remembering what I said the day before yesterday unless it was basically the truth. But my brain's not big enough. So it helps me enormously. And it helps what I do. And my very last point is, you know, I, uh, very early on in my career, I was, I was working at a consultancy called Krama Saatchi that became Saatchi and Saatchi. And uh, we were working on a, um, <coughs> uh, the launch of a, a, a porridge, a flavored porridge for kids. It's called Crazy Oats, and we did all the packaging and everything. It was very exciting. And um, we launched it and did the ads and everything, and actually it went like that, and then it went like that. And uh, we all were sort of summoned to the meeting at uh, Quaker Oats, what was going on, what was happening. And so I was there as this sort of fairly young art director and a bit gobby, you know, because um, I didn't care then. And uh, <laughs> they were all sitting in this meeting. It was one of those meetings, again, where I had that. They were all talking about sales distribution and, you know, a point of sale and shelf space. And I'm going, oh, what's all this about, you know? And couldn't work it out and what they were going to do and uh, incentives and on pack promotions and stuff like that. And I said, have you tasted it? And they went, oh, this little voice from this bar. Right? And they went, what do you mean? I said, have you tasted it? Oh, we've done hall tests and we've done that. And we've, you know, oh, look, we've got the figures here. Look. And I said, no, have you tasted it? They went, no. And I said, it's shit. <laughs> It's shit. It tastes like cardboard. Look, let's get some. We'll make it now. And they—they they thought I was mad. You know, they thought I was completely stupid. And I—I I just couldn't. I thought this is crazy. I'm dealing with people who are mad. You know, this is—they don't know what's going. And of course, it failed. My point about that is, you know, number of times I've been in meetings where the solution should have been, why don't you make the product better? You know. Why don't you make the product better? What a brilliant strategy that is. That's fantastic, John. Did you go to business school in Seattle or anything like that? No, no, I didn't go there. Just, you know, I use stuff. And I'm going to finish. But if I was to say the one thing I have observed uh, amongst all those other things from my career, the people who've succeeded in companies are the ones who passionately believe in their product. And if, you're, if you don't passionately believe in that product, if you're just one of those professional marketing people who come along, do all the right things, get the sales force organized, you know, unpack promotions, all that, all that stuff, you know, then you're fine, you'll be okay. But you'll never be great unless you love it. Uh, because ultimately, it's what you feel that matters. And I say to all my creative people, you know, when we're doing an idea, I say to them, well, do you like it? And they go, yeah, well, that's great. Then you like it. At least you know one person in the world loves this. And that you've got to start from. Uh, and I'll just leave you with one thought on that. And there was this, um, uh, about this thing about what you believe is ultimately important. And it was J.K. Rowling was being interviewed on the radio. And she was um, asked the question. And I thought it was the brilliant question. And the question to her was, when you were writing Harry Potter, he goes from the age of 8 to 18, I understand, something like that. The interviewer said to her, what age child did you have in mind when you wrote the book? And there was this wonderful pause. And she said, I didn't. I wrote it for myself. And that's what you're doing. You're doing it for yourself because you know one person in the world genuinely thinks it's great. Thank you very much. Um, but there have been some questions, John. So the first one, uh, the room would like to know, who's the best client you've ever worked with and why? 
I always get that question, and I'll answer it in a slightly different way. You know, people always say to you, who's, you know, who is the client you'd love to work with? You know, because I've worked with some wonderful people, so picking one of them out is, is you know, would be unfair on the others. And I always say, people expect you to go, you know, incredible, they expect, especially if you're a bloke, they expect you to say, oh, Victoria's Secrets, I'd like to work on Victoria. No, no. The person I'd like to work for is the person who comes into me and says, John, I want to change the way this industry is perceived. So if they came in making nuts and bolts and they said, I want to change the way people think about nuts and bolts, that's the person I want to work for. Didn't really True. answer the question there, did you? No, I didn't. I didn't. I always ignore the brief anyway. You know? yeah. <laughs> okay. The brief is just a starting point, you know. <laughs> And I'm just the account manager. You're, yes. yeah, account, you're okay. account lady. So um, when process overtakes innovation uh, has been something that a lot of people have written down today, I'm sure, and it came up on the app a few times. On the agency side now, we have traffic departments, we have creative services. On the marketer side, we have the rise of directors of operations and obviously procurement. For all these people going home tomorrow or going back to the office tomorrow, going back to the agency, going back to their, um, to their businesses, what piece of advice would you give to the agency side and to the marketer of what to do not to let process overtake innovation? I think, uh, very, good, very good question. I think you've got to get everybody believing that they have a part to play in making the work better. And one of the things that we always do at BBH is we, or everybody who joins BBH sees either uh, myself or Nigel or Simon Sherwood or Gwyn Jones, one of the top people, and we absolutely say to people what this agency is about is about the work all roads lead to the work and it doesn't matter what you do we have a legendary doorman called Victor who's from Nigeria and Victor helps me sell better work because when the clients come in he is a guy who's remembered their names remember what they do what they do welcomes to the the agency and they think to themselves my god if the doorman's that good, the ideas must be even better. <laughs> no, you know. So everybody plays a part in it. And I've got just one thing about that. I've never understood. You know, you, sometimes you get a client, I'm riffing here a bit. You, you get a client who comes in and says, we want to be the best um, in the world in whatever, bread making. And uh, you don't go to their factory and it's a shit factory, you know. And you go, what point did best become shit in your, you know, where does best stop and shit take over. I don't, I don't understand it. And, you know, the brilliant thing, if you... I mean, I didn't want to read it, but Steve, the, the Steve Jobs book is worth reading. He passionately believed in every point of, of, of encounter with his product. He did not... He wanted everything about it to be great. And I think that's what great businesses are. You don't have a shit reception. You don't have a shit doorman. You don't have dirty windows if you want to make the best jeans in the world. So important. Thank you very much, no, John. My pleasure. Thank you, Thank you very much.